So, welcome everybody to another episode of the All Time High Podcast. I am your host, General Mort, and today we're going to be talking about gas fees and why they're too damn high, why they're hard to fucking bring down, and how that's going to be changing in the future. <clears throat> Obviously, working and playing around in the Ethereum ecosystem right now is very expensive, and that sucks because as an enthusiast, I want to go and play around and do fun, cool shit, but it's just cost too damn much for me right now. So, first off, as always, we're going to talk about a little bit of news before we move on. Um, so, <clears throat> whoa. <clears throat> the NFT boom is continuing, guys. Um, we talked about NFTs last week in depth, and um, just this past week, uh, Artist Beeple, who we talked about, uh, sold another piece um, called Every Day. I think the Every Day is the first 5,000 days, something like that. Sold it for $69 million. $69 million. It's <laughs> absolutely absurd. This is a digital painting, um, and it was uh, hosted by a auction house called Christie's, I believe. And um, it's, to date, the biggest NFT sale uh, ever. So that's really exciting to see. Um, there's some more institutional involvement. You know, it's, that's a popular kind of auction house that already does a lot of art stuff. So if they're they're adopting things, then that's, that's a good sign, in my opinion. Uh, the Ethereum Berlin upgrade is coming on April 14th. Um, this is mostly a series of minor upgrades. Nothing to be super duper excited about uh, right now, at least from a consumer standpoint. I think it's good for the network, but... Uh, doesn't gonna, not gonna mean a whole lot to us. As I mentioned earlier, Bitcoin has reached a new all-time high at 60k. Woo! Very exciting stuff. Uh, Ethereum is uh, getting close to its all-time high. The bulls are back in town, my friends, and uh, I think it's because of that stimmy money, right? So um, that's exciting. So I think the price is gonna keep going up. Uh, maybe I don't fucking know. Anyways, um, Terry Crews launched his own crypto cryptocurrency it's called power and he did it via this platform called roll and um this is actually really fascinating uh this kind of is i'm gonna do an episode on this uh it's a concept called user generated capital or like social capital and it's basically more about like investing in influencers investing in celebrities well not celebrities but investing in people versus investing in companies it's a interesting concept so he's launched his own currency uh, on roll i think roll is doing like i think their market cap is like 1.2 billion um they got a lot of creators on there that are launching their own own tokens so you can invest in a creator kind of early on and hope that their value appreciates it's very fascinating um <clears throat> and then lastly coinbase uh as you guys know is about to go public and they hit a 90 billion dollar valuation in the private markets so it hasn't even hit the public market yet um i would expect that price to probably keep going up we'll see what happens so i think they're trading at 375 a share right now and then also blockfi raised uh, 350 million on a three billion dollar found uh, valuation so some of these more institutional um like bridges almost are, are starting to gain a lot of traction which is really good but let's get into it let's talk about gas um <clears throat> and why it kind of sucks so what the fuck is gas so gas all right so every time you make a transaction on the Ethereum network, you pay a gas fee. Now, what the hell is gas fee? Uh, it's a transaction fee. Um, basically, uh, if you ever make transactions or accept transactions with Visa or MasterCard um, or whatever, any other credit card uh, company, um, you typically pay... Well, maybe not you, but the business typically pays like one and a half to like 3%, somewhere around there uh, on every transaction, which is kind of a lot if you're a business, honestly. And um, it's very similar to, to when you make a transaction on Ethereum. Gas is basically that transaction fee, but gas is also kind of like the fuel for the Ethereum network, right? Um, it's, it's really the resource that powers all of the blockchain transactions. So... <clears throat> but why do we pay gas fees, right? Like, what, what what's the point? Because um, ideally, you know, everybody, yeah, it's few, it's maybe it's um, <clears throat> it should be feeless or it should be super cheap, right? Uh, it should be super cheap, but feeless maybe not so much. We'll see. Um, but this this fee is basically paid to the miners of the network. So we've talked about mining a little bit in the past, and I'll do a little a little brief overview right now. Um, but basically, when you make a transaction, let's say you're you're Alice, and Alice wants to send one ether to bob right when she goes to make that transaction she's going to submit the transaction to the network 
So this is going to go to the network, and you've got all these nodes. Just imagine these circles are, are Ethereum nodes, right? So once it gets broadcast to the network, a miner is going to pick up that transaction and start mining for that block. They're going to do this complicated computational puzzle, and then they're going to find out what the next block is, and they're going to basically verify that transaction. <clears throat> After they've done this, they get paid out a little bit in ETH. So this process is called proof of work. And the best way to kind of summarize that is the Ethereum miners are being paid for doing the work, for verifying transactions and processing them, right? So <clears throat> this is what is called a consensus mechanism. And I won't get too deep into consensus, but this basically is a protocol that allows all the miners to agree on a single verifiable truth, which is the blockchain, right? So <clears throat> to sum up, you pay the gas fee. That fee is basically a resource that is paid to the miners who are helping process the transaction and um, basically contribute to the overall health of the network, right? Um, both Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin are are proof of work uh, protocols right now. Um, there are more, uh, but these obviously are the, the most significant. So the miners are taking your money. More or less, yes, uh, the miners are taking your money, um, which kind of sucks uh, because, but, but it's also important at the same time. And, and I'll explain why right now. So we talk about um, this concept of incentives. So in other words, why would Ethereum nodes voluntarily process transaction without an incentive so in other words <clears throat> the promise of rewards is basically why people are willing to run ethereum miners because they know that they're going to earn something out of it right it's not just a virtuous opportunity for them to contribute to a decentralized network it's uh it's a it's a monetary um investment it's something for them they, they stand to gain something from that right so but let's talk a little bit more about gas Gas is basically the, it's the unit that measures the amount of computational effort that is required to execute a certain operation on Ethereum. Let me say that one more time. It's the unit of measurement, basically, uh, of the amount of computational effort that is required to execute a certain operation on the Ethereum network. And <clears throat> so gas fees vary, uh, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, simple transfers are typically cheaper if you're sending money from point A to point B, um, but interacting with a smart contract, not so much. So the native currency for gas, or rather the native currency of Ethereum is Ether, right? And <clears throat> gas comes in a subdenomination of Ether. So as you guys may or may not know, um, almost all cryptocurrencies uh, are divisible up to several decimal places. So <clears throat> the smallest subdenomination of Ether is called Wei. And Wei is equal to 10 to the 18th power of an Ethereum. So incredibly tiny. That's basically 18 zeros, right? Gas fees equal number crunchy. Yeah, more or less. Um, when you are accepting a, or rather the price of the gas fee is determined by the number crunching. So if there's more work that needs to be done, going to be higher gas fee. So <clears throat> you've got way. That's 10 to the 18th power. But we don't really price things in way because um, it's too small. So we do it in GUE. And GUE is gigaway. And this is equal to 0.0000. .000 Zero zero, is it six zero zero one, ether. So, this is basically how all gas is priced right now. Um, gas prices range uh, from very small amounts of guay uh, to pretty high, um, and uh, ether is not the only uh, you know protocol that has this kind of system. Um, Bitcoin actually also has a subdenomination. And the subdenomination of Bitcoin is called Satoshis. And I believe this is the smallest uh, subdenomination of Bitcoin. So, you know, however many zeros go into that. And, you know, 
aptly named for the creator of Bitcoin, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. But so again, <clears throat> this gas not only incentivizes the network, but it also secures the network. Because you've created this incentivized opportunity, right? So there's no good reason for nodes to be bad actors uh, because they're they're getting paid out. They're getting paid for their work. So um, people are more than likely uh, not going to try and attack the network. It also secures the network because it prevents the spamming of transactions, right? So uh, right now, this is kind of what's happening. The Ethereum network is getting clogged because there's so much activity and the way that the protocol is just currently designed just can't support that uh, that volume of transactions. So things get slowed down. That's why gas fees are so high right now is because you're competing with so many other people to get your transactions verified. So the average rates adjust based on network activity. Whoa, what just happened? Oh, no. Sorry, guys. Okay, I'm just going to start a new page. <laughs> so, <clears throat> gas fees uh, are variable. So, if you want to get your transaction verified quicker, you can pay a higher gas fee. And it will be processed faster. Now... Uh, like I said, rates change based on network network activity. So if there's a lot of network activity, if the um, you know just network is really hot, then the average gas fee is going to go up. So basically, you are going to have to pay a baseline amount so that you are competitive with other people who are trying to get their transactions verified. So they're highly variable. Uh, you can technically set a really low gas fee if you want to and save money. Um, you can't really do that on smart contract interactions, but on basic transfers you can. And um, problem is, though, you might have to wait hours if you set it too low, maybe days or weeks. And sometimes your transaction will just get stuck in the mempool forever. Um, so, like I said, um, gas fees for transfers are are cheaper. So uh, let's actually, sorry, let me go back a second. I got I got flustered because my thing went away. So. <laughs> Let's talk about the current situation on why gas fees are so high. So there are two types of transfers. I mean, there are more, but these are the, the two most important. So first is um, simple transfers, right? And this is like our, like our Alice to Bob example. Um, your simple transfer just sends currency from point A to point B. And this could be anywhere from a dollar to a few dollars. Uh, right now, I think like it's not uncommon to see something like 120 gui, um, which I think is like, I don't know, it might be a couple bucks, maybe three bucks, something like that. So it's not too bad. Um, <clears throat> problem is, if you're trying to send a small amount of money, that's not ideal. Uh, you know, maybe in America, we're not often sending one dollar or two dollars or three dollars, but in other places, you might. So you definitely want something that's going to be commensurate with that um, with that price, right? Something that's really cheap if you're trying to send low value. So, uh, but the upside is this doesn't change if you're trying to send more. So if you want to send a million dollars to somebody, 120 gui, gui is a fucking steal. Um, if I want to send a million dollars, especially across borders, I'm probably going to pay 10% on that wire transfer, uh, which is extremely high. I mean, compared to a couple dollars, that's $100,000 versus a couple dollars. You just saved a monumental amount of money because of just the way that the system is designed, right? So the other one uh, that I've been mentioning is uh, smart contract interactions, right? Now, smart contracts typically involve a lot more complexity uh, with how they're basically you've constructed what kind of um, assets you're transacting and usually just involves a lot more computational power. So because that happens, these gas fees are exponentially higher. So I would say uh, like last week when we were talking about minting NFTs, I minted my NFT and I think I paid like $32. Uh, 
Um, and that was at one in the morning when gas fees were low and network activity was kind of on the lower end. Um, but you could, I mean, realistically expect anywhere to pay a hundred dollars or more, um, just depending on the nature of your transaction. So if it's something that if you want to mint multiple NFTs or something like that, you just, you're going to pay more. Um, same thing in DeFi. DeFi is still really expensive to use um, just to do a simple swap. In other words, sell, let's say, Ethereum for another currency. Um, you're probably looking to pay at least like $25 to $50, uh, at least based on my experience. So <clears throat> this limits participation. Obviously, uh, people who want to get in and play around are going to be turned away by this problem. Um, you know, especially if I want to buy something for cheap. If I want to only spend $10 or $15, there's no way in hell I'm going to pay $30 or $25 or $50, right? So <clears throat> I, I kind of think that the expectation is going to be huge growth when uh, some of these scalability problems are solved. So that's pretty much how gas works. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, now's the time because I am going to move on and start talking about um, Ethereum and the congestion and why there's high fees right now. I did kind of touch on it a little bit already. All right, so let's move on. Uh, Ethereum and network congestion. So what is what is causing the high fees? specifically. So <clears throat> Ethereum is by far the most popular smart ca uh, smart contract platform in the world or in the blockchain ecosystem, right? Currently, Ethereum, uh, let's do this just so it's clear. Does that mean ETH is not scalable? No. <laughs> That's the whole point. So um, but it is why the network is cluttered, correct? So uh, basically right now, Ethereum on average processes 1 million transactions daily, which is quite a bit, especially for a, you know, ecosystem that's completely decentralized, right? And in Q1 alone, they're on track, or it is on track rather, to process or settle 1.6 trillion dollars in Q1 alone, which is super duper impressive. So there's already a ton of activity on the network, which is why ETH is valued so highly. Um, a lot of these other projects that are supposedly ETH killers, um, not that same kind of activity or network effect, right? So <clears throat> quickly, um, smart contract platform. There are multiple. Ethereum is not the only one, um, but it is, like I said, by far the most popular. Uh, it's basically a blockchain that allows you to build applications on top of it. So there are others, like I said, um, using infrastructure, let's say. So the blockchain infrastructure is what Ethereum is, or Ethereum is a blockchain infrastructure. It's a smart contract platform, a place where you can code and build new applications on top of it. So um, right now, they can't support the volume of transactions. Volume is just too damn high. And um, the average network utilization rate is great, is a, like about 97%. So almost at all times, 90% of, of the network's like resources are being used, which is insane. That's really, really high. And unfortunately, that means that they can only kind of do about 15 transactions per second on average um, on a regular basis. So there are just too many transactions. They can't be all processed at once. Um, so you've you basically got a waiting line, right, of people who are setting higher and lower gas fees. So people who really want to get their, their transaction out immediately, um, if you're trying to make a trade, they're going to set a high gas fee so that they can assure that their transaction is going to get in on the next block, which happens every 13 seconds, I think. So they can only verify so many transactions and they can only do it so fast. So um, this is why, like I mentioned, some some users are willing to pay higher fees because they just, they want to get that stuff through. And those miners, that fee goes to the miners. So the miners are going to prioritize high gas fees because it's that's profit for them. Um, that's how they make their money, right? So uh, quickly, uh, I will talk about a little bit EIP-1559 at the end, but um, they seek to solve some of these issues. This is not necessarily going to bring down gas fees but it will place constraints on um, 
the upper and lower limits of gas fees so that it's going to be a little bit more standardized going forward and people won't be able to kind of game it as much if that makes sense so in order to really understand this problem though we have to talk about what's called scalability trilemma And to illustrate this, you have three primary components of a blockchain network, and they are security. Actually, uh, first we're gonna do, we're gonna put scalability at the top. So scalability is one. It's the ability for the network to scale and grow and process a high volume of transactions and support high high levels of activity. And then you have decentralization. And this is simply just the fact of how decentralized it is. Uh, how many people are running nodes on the network, how many people are using it, etc. And then lastly, you have security. How difficult is it to change information on the network? Um, you know, how difficult is, is it to hack it, right? So <clears throat> every blockchain project basically has these three primary concerns, right? And they're all trying to solve these issues equally. Now, some other platforms have favored scalability over decentralization and security. So meaning that maybe they're less uh, decentralized and it's, you know, by proxy, not as secure. But Ethereum specifically has always prioritized decentralization and security first. So Ethereum is the most decentralized network out of all the smart contract platforms, and it's also the most secure because there are so many miners that are participating, so many nodes, that it's incredibly difficult to gain greater than 51% of that hashing power, right? So they have elected to optimize for decentralization and security, and they're offloading scalability concerns to what they call layer two solutions. And <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit more about layer two solutions uh, in a second, but basically Ethereum's focus is that anyone has the opportunity to run a full node using consumer hardware. So in the case of Bitcoin, um, you can't run a node with consumer hardware. Their algorithm has basically become so complex uh, that they um it's no longer possible to mine bitcoin with like a, a standard computer you have to have what's called an asic and these are basically specialized computers that are built for the purposes of mining a particular currency so um, almost all bitcoin mining uh, these days is done with asics which are basically expensive things so uh, what is a node um, like i mentioned earlier uh, a node is essentially a computer that is helping process transaction. It's a miner. So miners are nodes, they're synonymous. Um, a node is basically a computer that's running particular software that can grab transactions that are broadcast by the network, do some work and process it, right? So <clears throat> it's important for everybody to basically uh, have the ability to run a node because they want, um, they want it to stay decentralized. They don't want to limit participation because of high upfront costs, right? So it's a really, really important part. And um, basically part of the reason that this is, uh, this issue comes up is what's called state size. And state size is basically a reflection of the overall size of the blockchain in terms of data, right? So <clears throat> I won't be, I won't lie with you guys. Uh, I, I haven't been able to find a concrete answer on how big the Ethereum state size is right now. But I would say estimates, based on what I have read, place it somewhere between like 250 and 600 gigabytes, right? That's a lot of data, but it's really not that crazy if we think about it. Um, and I, Paul, if you have a link, I'm sorry that it got deleted. You can post it in the Discord if you like. Um, so 250 to 600 gigabytes sounds like a lot, but storage is pretty cheap these days. So that's really not that bad. Um, I mean, our phones come with data, you know, storage that's if not as big as that, bigger, right? Maybe not, I don't know. So <clears throat> this brings us to the problem of ETH killers, right? So you'll hear a lot that there are these smart contract platforms that just their tech is, their community says their tech is better and it's it's gonna kill Ethereum, 
Ethereum won't be able to compete. And, you know, some examples of these ETH killers are Cardano, Binance Smart Chain, Tezos, Tron, EOS, the list goes on. There's a lot of them. And they've been saying that it's going to kill ETH now for four years or so. And nobody has really been able to even come close to doing what Ethereum is doing. And part of that reason is because, like I mentioned, if we look at our scalability trilemma, they have sacrificed decentralization and security in favor of scalability for something that's just faster, right? But it's not as safe. That's the problem. And in some cases, this is an increase. This is due to an increase in state size. So uh, when we say that, you know, anyone can run a node on Ethereum, suddenly that's not the case with some of these other projects. So let's take a look at Binance Smart Chain for an example, because it's been blowing up lately. Um, <clears throat> and basically, Binance Smart Chain has sacrificed decentralization and security. I think they only have like 21 nodes or so that operate the blockchain. In comparison, Ethereum has over 100,000 globally. Um, for ETH. And their state size is growing 10 times faster than that of Ethereum. What that means is, you know, instead of the fairly manageable 250 to 600 gigabytes of Ethereum, Binance's chain will grow by 3.65 terabytes every year, which is a lot. I can already tell you that probably most people's computers don't even have that much storage space. So consumer hardware is not going to be able to support a node. And that hurts decentralization because you're not giving everybody an opportunity to participate, which I think is a really significant problem. Um, you know, the core tenant, you know, these are the core tenants of blockchain tech, scalability, decentralization, and, and security, uh, or at least of, of this problem. And I think you just, you need to ensure that every single one of those things is going to be taken care of. It's going to be, you know, good. So I think Ethereum has the right uh, approach here emphasize decentralization and security, and then scalability will come via other solutions. And now we are going to talk about what those solutions are. So you guys may have heard, oh, well, if you've been watching my show, you've definitely heard of Ethereum 2.0. Now, what the hell is ETH 2.0? Um, this is a series of upgrades that's going to take place over the next couple of years, and it will significantly make the um, blockchain faster, and more secure, right? Um, what's up, Boos? Uh, so the first series of this upgrade is called Phase Zero, which is also known as the Beacon Chain. And basically what Phase Zero and the Beacon Chain have done is this is the first step in changing Ethereum from a proof of work network Remember, we talked about proof of work and, you know, the miners get paid for that work to what's called proof of stake. And proof of stake is an entirely different consensus algorithm. Um, it doesn't require nearly as much computational power, um, but it does require a monetary investment. So <clears throat> in order to run a node, once Ethereum becomes fully 2.0, you will need 32 Ethereum. And basically what you're doing is you are putting up that 32 Ethereum as collateral. And that is basically your, you're trying to prove to the network that you're going to be honest. If you're dishonest, if you do something shady and the network sees it, you're going to take your ETH. It's gone. So this incentivizes basically um, truthful participation, right? So um, remember, just to clarify, proof of work is computers solving complex mathematical problems in order to get paid out in Ethereum proof of stake. You are running a node to process transactions and um, you're staking your money. But you, you know, this, this process still involves getting paid out in the form of interest. Um, 32 Ethereum is, is what you need to participate in, well, to run a full node. Now, um, 
that's not going to be the only way to stake Ethereum in the future. Um, there are different protocols that are working on like pools. So if you don't have 32 Ethereum, you can join a pool and um, they might take a small cut for that, but you could probably still some earn something like 10% back uh, in interest over the course of a year. The thing is when you stake though, you do have to lock it up for a year or longer. So, uh, and sometimes reward uh, rates are higher if you choose to lock it for longer. But yes, you can pull for one. Uh, there are a couple already right now, uh, like Staker. I think it's Staker.io. This is run by the Anchor Network. Um, there's another one that will be coming out called Rocket Pool that people are really excited about. Um, so there will be new solutions for this, but it's not like super duper necessary right now because right now uh, on the Beacon Chain, there are, like I said, I think 100,000 validators. And I think there's over $5 billion dollars and Ethereum currently locked into the beacon chain. And right now, they're not doing anything. They're just hanging out there. They're they're basically a... It's proof that they're going to become... You know, that this is going to be switched over, right? That they're going to be there once uh, proof of stake fully arrives, right? So, the next phase, which I believe is expected sometime this year, is called sharding. And this will basically introduce a, it's a new way for uh, Ethereum to store information. And um, you will basically have, it. in other words, this is supposed to increase Ethereum's throughput by 64, or 64 times. So instead of 15 transactions per second, it becomes something like a thousand, right? Now this is on the layer one version of Ethereum, right? So this is just layer one throughput. And we'll talk about kind of what layer what layer two is in just a second. So the last final phase of this will be a full, full move to um, proof of stake. So initially there will be like a hybrid system actually, where you know proof of stake nodes will handle some set of transactions and proof of work nodes will handle the other set of transactions. But eventually this will become full proof of stake, and at that point. The Ethereum 2.0 upgrade will basically be complete. Um, and at that point, the throughput of transaction speed will be super duper high. Can you provide a link where uh, we can learn more about this on Discord? Yeah, I, I will definitely post links for you guys to learn more about um, all this stuff in Discord uh, after I'm done. So let's talk about layer one versus layer two, because I've mentioned a couple things. I've mentioned like Ethereum layer one scaling, and I've mentioned layer two scaling solutions. So layer one is the original Ethereum blockchain. And basically, I'm going to draw you guys a little, little diagram. So imagine that this blockchain is Ethereum. This is the base layer. So every transaction you currently make on Ethereum um, operates on this layer one. You're processing your transactions. You're making your transfers all on layer one. Now, it is possible to build alternate chains or solutions on top of this layer one. And this is known as layer two. So layer two solutions can basically bundle up transactions or move those transactions off of the main chain so that they're freeing up resources onto the, the original chain, right? Oh, shoot. So <clears throat> because you're freeing up some of these resources, hopefully this causes fees to go down on the main chain but you're also no longer transacting fully on the layer one. So you might be doing a whole bunch of stuff, doing transfers on layer two, and some of these fees might be, there might be no fees, depending on what you're doing. So, like I said, you know, layer one, it's max speed right now is 15, but these layer two solutions are gonna be exponentially faster. And I would say, you know, probably somewhere between 2,500 and 9,000 transactions per second based off of the different solutions, right? So <clears throat> just to sum up, layer twos built on top of Ethereum. So like decentralized applications that are built on top of Ethereum, a lot of them are going to implement their own layer two solutions, right? 
So while scalability is going to be solved in a variety of ways and long term through the Ethereum 2.0 upgrade, that might take a couple of years. Um, layer 2 solutions are going to have an immediate effect and these solutions are coming really soon. So let's talk about some of the popular ones. So layer 2 solutions. So there's a ton of these different scaling solutions. Um, there are things like sidechains. It's another project called Plasma. Or not project, but type called Plasma. State channels. There's all kinds of shit. But there are really two that you have to be worried about right now, or at least just know about, not worried necessarily. Um, and the first one is called Optimism. And these are both, by the way, sorry, I should have clarified. Uh, so the types of immediate solutions that you're going to see come in the form of what are called rollups. And this is essentially a process where you bundle a bunch of transactions together, and then you only submit a small amount of that to the actual main chain. So optimistic rollups or optimism um, basically require validator nodes to check for fraud. So again, this is a specialized computer that's basically constantly checking the network and looking for fraud. If they see a fraudulent transaction, they'll notify the network and appropriate action will take place. And basically what will happen is if you're running a, a validator node or a... Um, I forget what the other term is. But in other words, if you're processing transactions via optimistic rollups, you have to stake funds in order to basically prove your authenticity um, or to prove the legitimacy of your transactions, right? And similar to like what we talked about with staking, fraudulent activity means loss of funds. So this is all kind of ties into that idea of incentivization. Um, you know, making sure that you are incentivized to be honest, because if you aren't honest, you're going to lose money, right? Um, there are some limitations with optimistic rollups, um, and this basically means, or rather, the, the biggest limitation is that there are long wait times for withdrawals, right? So you might actually have to wait uh, one to two weeks to get your funds off of layer two. So when we move from layer one to layer two, typically pay a transaction fee to move all of your assets onto the layer two, and then you're gonna also have to pay to take them off, right? Um, so that that's gonna be most of the fees that you're paying. The fees that you actually pay on layer two are gonna be incredibly small. So um, this one to two week waiting period is, is unfortunate, but um, the good news is uh, some of these uh, layer two solutions are going to be interoperable. So you may not actually have to pay. You may not actually have to move your money off of layer two very often because there will be other layer two solutions um, using the same tech, right? So the next one I want to talk about is called um, ZK rollups. And this stands for zero knowledge rollups. What does that mean? It means that Basically, instead of submitting the full breadth of the transaction to the main chain, all that this solution is doing is submitting proof. So they're basically saving a lot of data by only submitting a small amount of that data to the actual main chain. So it's substantially more efficient than doing everything on layer one. And uh, right now, the most popular solution I see for that's utilizing ZK rollups is a project called Immutable X. Um, these guys are rather Immutable is the company, Immutable, Immutable X is the solution. And these are the people that are responsible for the game Gods Unchained. And their focus is pretty heavily on um, on NFTs and gaming and creating an, you know, basically making NFT transfers really cheap so that games can scale. Um, and these guys say that once, once their Immutable X is complete, you'll be able to do something like 9,000 transactions per second using their solution. Remember, Ethereum currently is just 15. So these things are going to change a lot. Um, now, there are limitations, of course, just like with Optimism. And basically, the primary limitation of ZK rollups is that they're 
really only best for um, simple transfers. So, you know, when we move NFTs, uh, those are, mo mo you know, usually simple transfers, just moving the NFT from place to place, right? So, like I said, these layer two solutions are supposed to be interoperable at some point. Uh, meaning that if you do move your funds to layer two, that doesn't mean you always have to move them back to layer one to change platforms. Um, you might just automatically be able to move between platforms and have all of that activity exist on layer two. So layer two solutions are, are kind of what's coming first. Um, eventually, you know, we'll get to that point where we have Ethereum 2.0 and the main chain will be super fast. But everything first is going to come via layer two. And these solutions are coming very quickly. Um, I believe that optimism, uh, so you can check out optimistic rollups. Actually, optimistic rollups is what it's called. Optimism is the project. Um, I think they're going to be launching like this month. Uh, they announced last month or this month that it, it was going to be going live. So I would expect um, a bunch of applications to be applying this technology um, to their dApps over the next month or two. I don't know exactly when Immutable X is going live, but there has been a lot of hype and activity around it. And um, they basically announced their official plan for how it was going to roll out with Gods Unchained, I think on March 4th. So these things are almost ready. And um, these are the things that are going to scale the network really quickly in the short term, right? So hopefully when you go to Uniswap, it doesn't cost $50 to <laughs> make a swap, right? So to summarize, gas. Gas is fuel for the Ethereum network. It is basically the resource that powers everything, and that resource is Ether. Just cut up and basically displayed in different subdenominations, right? In the form of GUE. Oh, no. Right, so we have GUE. That is how you pay gas. And these gas fees are paid to the miners. Now, let me be clear. When Ethereum 2.0 launches officially, miners will no longer exist, at least not in their current state. They're going to basically become um, staking nodes. So instead of a computer that does complex computations, um, it's going to be a node that basically has 32 Ethereum locked into it, right? So this will ultimately stop concerns with the environment and hopefully i say this on a personal level ends the gpu shortage because i want a new gpu what about all that hardware i don't know it's up to them i mean these people basically launched businesses um you know, knowing that this is going to happen. In fact, the miners are trying to fight back right now. Uh, they're trying to say if they if they move forward with EIP-1559, that they're going to fork off and create their own Ethereum network and all this stuff. Um, I don't think that's really going to happen. If it does, I don't really think the new coin is going to have any weight. Um, and Vitalik basically responded and said, all right, if you want to do that, we're just going to push proof of stake forward faster. So... Um, my guess is all that hardware is just going to be liquidated. People are, you know, if you have consumer hardware, you're going to be trying to sell for what it's worth. Um, so hopefully sell some of those GPUs back to people who want them um, and whatnot. So I don't know. I'm not really worried about it. Uh, so like I said, EIP 1559 um, is a big part of this because the reason is not that Ethereum is moving to proof of stake. What they hate about this is that basically EIP 1559, which is an Ethereum improvement proposal, is basically uh, somebody submitted a proposal to improve the network, right? Um, this is going to introduce a burn rate for Ethereum transaction fees. So every time you pay a gas fee, a portion of that gas fee is going to be burned forever. Or deleted. So this is a mechanism um, that is actually really more so tailored to the economic, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's just the economy of Ethereum versus the, um, the actual speed of transactions and gas fees. And basically what this will do is it'll curb inflation. Right now, new Ethereum is minted when um, 
when when miners are paid out and this is actually going to burn a portion of that percentage so minor rewards are going to be reduced significantly maybe not significantly but by a good amount um via eip 1559 so they're trying to fight back right so <clears throat> People actually also think that this could turn Ethereum into a deflationary currency, which gives it scarcity and blah, blah, blah. Um, but like I said, you know, gas fees are high right now because of congestion. And there's just simply too much activity on the Ethereum network for it to handle. So that means that this stuff is going to be solved via Layer 2 solutions. There's no rush to really move Ethereum 2.0 forward right now because they're trying to make sure that it's not going to fuck anything up. Like, I think people get really annoyed because there's always been this like, oh, proof of stake is only 18 months away. They've been saying that for years. Um, but now Beacon Chain is live. There is a ton of Ethereum that's being staked on the Beacon Chain and these solutions are starting to actually hit the main net, right? So, but they're still going to take it slow. They're still going to make sure that Decentralization and security are the two most important parts of the Ethereum network. So the L2 solutions are going to scale it faster in the short term. And maybe in the long term too, we'll see. And I would say though that due to all of this, the outlook is really positive on Ethereum. Um, the issue is that the you know gas fees are, are bad. Or right now they're bad because they're just so expensive and this really limits adoption and participation. So people can't get on there and do all the things they want to do. I actually, you know, I more and more I've read about NFTs and stuff and I look at some of the art that people are making. I actually want to buy it. I don't know why. I just like, it looks, it's cool and it's neat, but I'm just not, I'm just not willing to pay the gas fees. So um, I imagine that there are a lot more people like me who want to get involved, who just can't afford it or aren't willing to um, lose so much money uh, by participating. So the scaling solutions are coming very quickly and I think it's gonna cause Ethereum to see explosive growth uh, within this year. Um, and I think it's gonna be really exciting and really great. I mentioned uh, before I started the show that Ethereum feels like it's this like, it's pressure cooker, it, you know, it's a ticking time bomb. It's just, it's just building up. You know, we see that utilization rate is 97%. It wants, it wants to pop off. It's just not ready. And uh, when the time comes, you will all know it and it will be very obvious, I think. So, uh, yeah, I know 1900 a day, which is really great. And we're, we're flirting with 2K, so that's already awesome. Um, and that's before any of this. This stuff hasn't even hit the, you know, hasn't really come out yet. So it's really, I'm really bullish for that reason. So um, that is all I got for you guys today on gas and uh, basically Ethereum scaling solutions. Um, thank you all so much for stopping by today and listening to me ramble. Uh, it's always really fun when I have people who are active and involved and, and are enjoying um, listening to me. So if you guys did enjoy the show today, please like, subscribe, follow, all that stuff. Um, if you look down in the info panel below, you guys will find my Twitter, my YouTube, my everything pretty much. I think the Discord is down there as well. I would love to have everybody who enjoyed today come join the Discord because it's just a nice place for us to talk and chat and share projects we like and you guys can ask me questions. It gives me ideas for content and whatnot too. So um, if you type hash exclamation, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Heike just did it, Discord. You can join right there. And um, as always, uh, I'll be sticking around for a little bit to hang with you guys. If you guys have any questions, if you want me to ask, look at any projects, stuff like that, feel free. But overall, just thank you everybody. I hope that you all have a wonderful weekend and I will see you all next time.